Hello and welcome to The External. I am your host, Tafari Green, and I have Jansen, co-host, back again. Hi, everybody. Jansen was with us when we talked about the cannabis article. My name is Jansen Gedwood. I am a graduate of the University of Florida. I studied primarily horticulture, ranging from organic and sustainable crop production to controlled environment agriculture, greenhouses, and hydroponics. I do a lot of work on crop stress behaviors, and I currently work for a leafy greens farm producing hydroponic leafy greens. Nice. And congratulations, by the way, on graduating. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I definitely was ready to be out of there. Yeah, I completely understand. I completely understand. Yeah, so we're talking about how viruses affect us and plants around us. I was talking to a friend. I can't remember what religion he is, but he was talking about (laughs) how it would be interesting if he fed me human for a day and not tell me, but then tell me after I would eat it. And he's vegan. <laughs> oh my and, God. And, he, and I was like, oh, wait, why are you asking? And he's, he wants to know how would it feel to know that I ate something like me, a living, breathing thing. And I was like, you do realize that plants are living organisms. Plus, and that's, I have tons of friends that are vegans. I've done the vegan thing a little bit, but that is that textbook stereotypical vegan argument where it's just, have you, what have you murdered somebody? <laughs> You're just like, Jesus, man, there's a difference between going to the grocery store and picking something up and it says USDA certified beef on there. And you're just like, okay, I can tell myself this is not humans. <laughs> yeah, you know, that exactly. if, if anything, you're like, that's clearly the line. <laughs> and it's like, nobody's out just telling everybody to, to eat whatever meat they can get their hands on of anything (laughs) but uh, yeah no heck it would be interesting to see what kinds of illnesses you could get from accidentally eating humans Uh, yeah and i it's just i plants have a very limited range of what they can show us as when they're hurting but plants do hurt too they send out signals and things when they're reacting to getting cut or chopped. Yeah, no, and we typically, (laughs) yeah, we typically associate a lot of medicines and kind of plant-based medicines with a bitter taste. And a lot of instances that bitter taste is from actual controlled exposure to stress. There's a lot of people that I'm sure there's not many people that are arguing this point, but I'm sure there's millions of plants on a, you know, daily basis that are being harassed into producing metabolites are these medicinal compounds for us. Hell, if you just talk about the cannabis industry, yeah, that, exactly. in cutting things, poking things, swiping things, you just it's like you're basically bullying plants to try to get them to give you more lunch money. Yeah. <laughs> That's a that weird thought cycle. Yeah, exactly. but, <laughs> but hey, I'm sure you're not going to see too many folks out there that are just like, <laughs> to save the plants, because at that point, I don't know what you're eating. Yeah. You're just filter feeding somehow. I think it's People forget that plants are living organisms and just like Mm -hmm. how we get sick, they also get sick. And I don't know, can I talk about it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So Jansen right now, he has COVID and plants may not have, be able to cough and get fevers and things like that, but they, viruses do affect them as well. And there are different ways or are trying to combat these issues, specifically powdery mildew and insects that give off vectors into plants and when i say vector i mean they're inserting a virus into the plant which eventually affects the plant one of the topics that we're going to talk about is the magnetic field right yeah so it's this is a fun phrase to go ahead and make yourself sound smarter than you really are but essentially (laughs) one of the interesting areas of kind of crop protection and disease and pest management has come around this area called, for disease at least, it's considered dielectric spore precipitation, creating a dielectric field or essentially two opposite charges that in this instance we have essentially a plastic tube and the outside of that tube is going to be positively charged. We're going to have a negatively charged copper wire that runs through the middle of this plastic tube and essentially 
you can the easiest way to think about it is I always tell people if you've ever rubbed a balloon on your head and you slowly take that balloon away from your head, you have an attraction that's essentially pulling your pulling your hair lightly towards that balloon. That's electrostatic force. Yeah. Uh, it's a weak static force, but on smaller bodies, it can actually wind up having a pretty big impact. A lot of technologies are looking into trying to utilize this small, attractive electric force to essentially snatch infective pathogens, like you're saying powdered mildew. They have infective spores called canidia that uh, freely float through the air, and those uh, can catch any bit of wind. They're microscopic, but what they've been able to do is they've been able to actually place cages around healthy plants, and they dump this canidia on top of these cages that contain maybe four tomato plants, but these cages are made up of those dielectric spore precipitators. And what they have found is that that cage is not present and they inoculate everything. They're getting 100% inoculation or pathogenicity of these crops. But whenever they drop them on top of these precipitators, it's really interesting. They're getting about maybe 5% infection rates versus 100% on every other one. And whenever they take these spore precipitators and they look at them underneath microscopes, they're actually able to see on the surface of these tubes small microscopic canidia that are just wiggling, and they're attached to that tube. They can't get away from it. And so they, they have successfully created essentially a machinery that's able to just snatch these infective particles right out of the air. And for anyone who's listening right now, if you go on to the externals Instagram page, I posted the picture and video of what the Canidia spore looks like when it's wiggling. It almost looks like a little tree that's dancing. It's really weird how that works. But can you tell them exactly what inoculation means and the process? Yeah, yeah. so whenever you're inoculating, when it comes to this, I'll just say it in overarching how you set up a scientific experiment. Typically, we, whenever we want to test something in science, we're going to always have a control which is not going to have the treatment or whatever we choose to do to the plants, it will not have that done to it. It will just basically be out there in the open like regular. So in this instance, for this science experiment, these people basically had a greenhouse that had several different hydroponic systems that were either covered in this spore precipitator or they were not. So the treatment in this instance is that spore precipitator. What they're doing to these systems, essentially, whenever I say inoculating, it just basically means we're taking these spores from an infectious plant disease that we know can, I hate to use the word again, infect or inoculate. Essentially, I just got COVID. I was by some sort of particle that was left behind by somebody else. And at that point, that is what we would consider that particle that got into me, that's considered an inoculant. Yes. And that is going to further impact my body by hijacking one of my cells and then taking the bandwagon ride on cellular division. And from there, we have that fantastic little virus that's able to replicate throughout your entire body. But yeah, so inoculating is simply just adding a disease onto something that you expect to, to lead to an infection. Yes. So. I just wanted them to understand what inoculation was. Yeah, no, I, I got you. <laughs> that's honestly, sometimes I forget sometimes that I'm not just always talking to people also doing yeah, know, when science you're in, experiments. Yeah, when so. you're in the science field, these are things that we forget about. This is like why I wanted to do the podcast. Because again, when I was talking to my friend today and telling him the process of cloning a plant, mm -hmm. he thought it was, it had a lot to do with like, GMOs and like yeah. being grown in the lab. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, no, all everybody clones plants and they don't realize that mm -hmm. they're cloning a plant. You're all you're doing is essentially cutting off a piece of the plant and putting it into the soil. That's part of cloning. There's other yeah. there's other parts of cloning, but when we say cloning, that's what that means. I mean, even the cannabis market has completely shifted away from what we call vegetative propagation and they've just nicknamed it cloning 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> so exactly whenever you ever is. hear, yeah, whenever you hear people talking about sharing clones, they're not <laughs> genetically <laughs> modifying any pre-existing organism. There, all they're doing is just simply, like you said, just having this mother plant that's an amazing plant that they want to keep the genetics running and consistently utilizing. And at that point, they'll just take a small cutting from that plant, and then they'll go ahead and stick it, root it, get it to the point where it's developed its own roots. And at that point, you now have a clone or an individual organism that is a an exact genetic replica of the whole GMO thing. Yeah. That is, yeah, you're not altering <laughs> anything. If anything, copy and pasting. <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah. Like, I love the way you said that, copy and pasting. That's exactly it. <laughs> yeah, as soon as you start backspacing or adding text in there, that's whenever there's you actually have genetic modification. Exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah. So I kind of blew his mind today when, it, when we were talking about that. <laughs> but so on the other side, when we're talking about pest management, such as white flies, thrips, and things like that, how do they do that? How do they conduct that? So this is going to be similar to the dielectric spore precipitator because essentially, I guess the easiest way to explain this one, and I have to say that. Uh, beforehand, I am not by any means an electrical engineer <laughs> or an engineer. I simply am very interested in learning about different kinds of pest management strategies and then trying to understand them to the best of my ability so then I can go ahead and present these potential solutions to my managers. So I frequently read articles, translate them into more simplified, understandable terminology, and then I go and I propose them. Whenever I talk about these things, I can't go too deeply into them just because I simply do not have the technical knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can, I'll paint a rough picture here, but essentially, uh, I like to say that they have brought the hand of God into the greenhouse. You always have that biblical reference of <laughs> something being smited or smote. Basically, a lightning bolt comes down and just zaps that thing yeah. for some sort of blasphemous thing that they, that person or thing has done. So in this instance, we can call it the hand of God. So uh, essentially, <laughs> for greenhouse growers, sucking insects like aphids, white flies, different insects like these are incredibly destructive to greenhouse horticulture or just growing plants in general. There is a massive amount of crop loss that we have that leads to food shortages, economic losses, that we're constantly trying to avoid. So we're always thinking of new kind of ingenuitive ways to try to keep these insects out of our greenhouse. Clearly, we've really relied a lot in the past on pesticides, biological different controls. kinds of chemical. Yeah, biological controls. And even now, I'd say that like biological controls are still, they're still in their, I'm not going to say they're larval stage, <laughs> but they they basically haven't fully reached that level of maturity. Biological controls are amazing in the fact that you're basically using one organism, insect, bacteria, fungi, something, to actually attack specifically your insect of issue. So aphids or white flies will use some parasitic wasps that will search them out and eat them. We'll use ladybug larvae that are predatory, and they'll go around and just be eating these things like crazy. But it takes a while to actually figure out how effective certain species are at with other species. And then anytime you're using a biological control, you also have to begin to think of how your environment is actually affecting the activity of a biological control. So even whenever we receive these parasitic wasps, we have to basically put them under a microscope and make sure they're active and moving around in there before we deploy them. And then there's, of course, we have a three-acre greenhouse. So when we deploy these parasitic wasps, we have to wait for them to encounter the pest. So yeah. there isn't necessarily an immediate kind of response to these treatments. So getting to the big picture here is what some researchers have been looking into, and I will say most of this research is done in Japan and other areas where it makes a lot of sense. You look at how big Japan is, and obviously they have to, it's an island country. They have to feed everybody that's there. Yeah. So crop losses to them are significant, and they're willing to throw money at it all day. And they really do not like pesticides and GMOs. Yeah. <laughs> Japan will never, it is not one of those places. So essentially what they've done is they've created a greenhouse screen 
So you can just imagine a, a regular greenhouse. Typically, we would have some sort of place where air is being taken into the facility, and those vents are usually screened off to keep insects from getting sucked right through those vents and put right into the into heaven, essentially. And so what they've done is they've created a double layer screen that sits in between their vents and the outside air. And essentially the outer screen that's directly outside, and it, it doesn't actually get anywhere into the uh, the greenhouse area, is again, positively charged. And then the second screen that's a little bit closer to the greenhouse vents is going to be negatively charged. Wow. So you have a current, an invisible current that is passing electricity through the air back and forth there. And essentially what they've done is they have created spaces in that, that first positively charged net or screen where insects can go through that net. But once they actually enter that space in between those two charged nets, they become like a new wire in the middle of a conduit. So you just essentially see an arc of electricity just shoot from one net to the other and make a connection right where that insect is in between the two nets, just wow. midair, and just fries that sucker right out of the air. And obviously... If you, the main benefit to using electricity, if you can do it reliably, is obviously you can generate electricity just with uh, solar power, wind power. There's a lot more advances in, in increasing the efficiency of these technologies, but also there is absolutely no residue left over to damage your crop or potentially create a food safety hazard, but there's also an immediate action that ends not only that pest life cycle, but if that pest was had eggs, we wow. may have been able to kill the adult form with some sort of pesticide or treatment. But, but those the, eggs, uh, yeah. yeah, not the juveniles. So in this instance, we're frying the whole thing. And so, yeah, it's a really interesting piece of technology. And I'm sure that we're going to start seeing it a bit more. The biggest issue that I've seen in the past with historically – there's been a lot of research into electricity and crop production and working the two together. We've even had people building tractors or just basically in the 50s, the 40s and 50s, building arc generators or basically these giant Tesla coil looking things <laughs> and put it on a tractor wow. and then just riding it out in the field and trying to use it for pest and weed eradication. But that one of the major be, issues. That would be yeah? interesting, especially when we're talking about things that really destroy a crop such as nematodes that can destroy mm -hmm. a crop for up to 20 years. If that thing could disintegrate all of those <laughs> nematodes and even their larva at any, at any of the life cycles, it just kills everything at all life cycles. Mm -hmm. It'd be amazing because the thing is that when it disintegrates everything, it's not leaving anything behind where a fungi can take over and then start being destructive. Yeah, it would definitely, I will hazard that with the saying that the, while it does have an effect on, on everything within a certain range of that, the actual source of electricity, it by no means can penetrate four feet into the soil. Soil just earth is something that naturally dampens electrical currents. Yeah. And anytime there's a lightning strike, you know, people in a 30 foot radius aren't electrocuted. It's more or less just that immediate area. So the penetrative depth that they've actually found working for these is somewhere around eight to 12 inches, which is also realistically where most of our kind of crop interactions occur. Yeah. If we're talking about annual, maybe two-year biennial crops, things like if we're talking about apple trees and things like that, you may wind up having, obviously, issues that you can't necessarily get to. But on that end, there's definitely things that you can do as far as utilizing electricity in orange groves or utilizing these uh, these netting systems that I was just talking about in, in instances where you're trying to grow maybe larger rooted crops. Maybe it's not trying to keep the the ground pests away but more so trying to keep the, the ones that are in the air can come in and act like you said as a vector for certain viruses maybe it's more to these companies to eradicate those pests as far as kind of nematodes and whatnot you can 
definitely have a lot of impact on a nematode population if they are readily at the root zone for your plants. Yeah. But I will say, like I said, I would hazard saying that this is one of those cure-all things, or at least <laughs> it'll leave you with a fresh slate because it, it will not. That's the, the real thing with this is that it's, it's scary sometimes to think about it. Like you said, if you eradicate everything, we rarely ever want to eradicate everything as far as microbial populations, pest populations, because we're going to wind up having the worst of the worst is going to wind up coming back the strongest and the fastest. Yeah, exactly. And with things like, like for us in hydroponics, pythium is a really big pathogen that we look oh, at. Yeah. It's a fungal pathogen that attacks roots. And anytime people try to utilize things like ozone or sanitizing agents or anything on their water, a lot of times they'll kill all of these beneficial microorganisms or even just microorganisms that may be eating. And basically they just eradicate all of that. But then, of course, you didn't really eradicate your actual source of the pythium. It got in there somehow and you just keep doing what you're doing. And the next thing you know, pythium is the strongest thing there. That's why it was already giving you such a big problem. So now... When everything else is gone, all you got is pythium. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, we always uh, we always want to make sure people target things like economic thresholds or essentially look at what level does it make financial sense for you to actually take action using preventative measures or pesticides or just electricity. Yeah, but it, it's definitely got – a pretty staggering history of use that actually I should have even said some of the interactions of electricity and plants have been studied and, and noted in, in cultures since I don't know, like the sixth century. Yeah. So it's pretty insane. What is it? In Japan, there's actually a lightning god. His name is Soma. And Soma is often depicted as a mushroom. Which people, <laughs> obviously, you're just like, why? If he's a lightning god, why would he be a mushroom? It was actually because a lot of the people that worshipped or diasoma were essentially deitizing. Or when I say deitizing, they're really making a holy connection to this, this fact that any time there would be thunderstorms or lightning storms in old Japan, you would wind up having these mushroom foragers, wild mushroom foragers, go out into the fields the next day. And they would actually see double, triple, four times the yield of mushrooms, wild mushrooms in these areas. And so they would attribute these blessings of mushrooms to the lightning and uh, making that initial connection that we now actually look at in real greenhouse horticulture saying we can actually increase germination, our plants tolerance to heat. And our plants of speed at which it does germinate or go from seed to plant. It's nuts. It's absolutely insane. Yeah, interesting because that's how mycelium communicates. It's mm -hmm. utilized through electrical like, signals. Yeah, through electrical signals. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it all works basically. Um, we consider this area of like electricity's effects on plants to be a black box because we know that there's so many species specific interactions and there's also so many times where you can utilize something like 22 volts of electricity being passed through wetted paper that has seeds on the inside of it and they're finding that these seeds like i said mate faster they have a higher chance of germinating and then on top of that whenever they're actually growing a plant, that plant is actually able to withstand higher heats or higher temperatures than their cohorts. And not only higher temperatures, but drought stress, yeah. frost stress. So there's a lot of interesting variables here, but then they found that if you went to 25 volts, you could actually have detrimental effects or bad effects on your plants. So there's this weird kind of like area where scientists are poking around right now trying to find not only the perfect kind of optimal voltages for certain plants, seeds, actual vegetative structures, and even fruit, but essentially it's, like I said, it's a black box. We're really still just stumbling around trying to figure it out. I find this all to be interesting, especially when we're talking about white, white flies, because destroyed the Floridian agricultural system when we're talking about oranges because you can't even if you want 
a orange that's from, let's say, Georgia, you can't bring that orange into Florida. You yeah, the, the Asian trouble for that. Yeah, yeah, the Asian citrus psyllid has absolutely demolished Florida's citrus industry. That's that is a fact, and it's somewhere monetarily in the realm of almost tens of billions of dollars, <laughs> almost like hundreds of billions of dollars. And if you just think of oranges, <laughs> so yeah, it's absolutely insane. And if you like whenever I think about crazy things that they do in Florida right now to deal with that. It, they have, I believe it is t almost 300 acres right now that they have built what's called the CUP structure. Essentially, it's like a citrus, it's, CUP stands for Citrus Under Protected Screens. And essentially, if you think of these patio screens that people have on their homes, essentially they've put up these screens over 200 to 300 acres oh. of citrus orchards. And it's all with screening on it that is so small that even microscopic psyllids can, can't make it through. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's crazy. They were, I was talking to some of the guys that run that structure up there, and they were saying the first couple of years, they ran into some issues. They wound up using wooden telephone poles to, like, stake in all the, kind of the, where they were going to be tying the screen to. And whenever they did that, they actually put the orchard close to a lake, or just a pond. Typically, whenever you're growing citrus or orchards, you want to have it close to a body of water just yes. because it helps with maintaining temperatures and different things like that. But so they, they sunk these telephone poles in near a lake. Obviously, we have hurricanes here in Florida. <laughs> so it was very interesting to see if you think of what happens whenever you have a piece of cheesecloth or just something that has a very fine mesh on it that's very light and you just blow on it like the wind from your breath can push it. So if you think about a hurricane, try hurricane force winds coming through mesh sizes in screens that are meant to keep out micro <laughs> microscopic organisms. You basically had the entire structure was demolished, but all of the plants inside of the structure were completely fine. Wow. The, the, uh, yeah, they said that the, the force of the wind completely, uh, ripped these telephone poles out. They were flooding from exposure to water from the lake. So they were sinking and collapsing. And they were saying the whole time, they came back days after, and the whole structure is torn down in pieces. But then the orchard of the citrus grove is just, it's completely fine there. A little bit of like leaves that have been lost, but the amount of wind reduction that they were getting from the psyllid size screening was enough to actually protect this from a hurricane. Oh, <laughs> they've since then they've rebuilt the structures with titanium poles and they'll use they're all grounded six feet into the ground, anchored there with cement blocks and things. So they've really stepped up their game and they moved a little bit away from any lakes that could be potentially overflowing. But yeah, and they're expanding. So they're going to five hundred acres soon. And so yeah, that that whole experiment revolves around just trying to like keep out these tiny bugs. The, the worth of these projects is just, it's invaluable. People can't even put a price on the amount that you could potentially wind up saving by finding this kind of golden technology. Wow. And this all goes into pest management. You, yeah. you, you want to utilize the least impact that could hurt your plant or crop then use something so hard like a insecticide or a pesticide of some sort because farmers don't want to use these things but sometimes they have to and that is relative upon the infestation that they're that they're having and when we're, when we're talking about white flies they're indirect pests which means they are not harmful to the plant but the viruses that get into the plant eventually affects the plant and kills off your whole crop. Yeah. <laughs> that is why we're just like, yeah, we don't like these bugs. <laughs> yeah, and we're looking to do anything, just fry them straight out of the air if we can, or just with the uh, with the smally bo smally, <laughs> the smaller bodied insects, like these white flies and psyllids, they're actually finding that some of the turning up the energy 
on these dielectric spore precipitators that we were using for snatching canidia or pathogens out of the air, they're actually able to do that with smaller bodied insects like these psyllids. So you can just imagine a psyllid flying close to a crop that it was looking at and all of a sudden it just, it's like it's stuck in a tractor beam and it just slowly gets pulled into this electrocuting box. Essentially. <laughs> we're basically trying to create highly preventative scenarios and environments that will keep us from ever really having to resort to chemical applications or really you know, breaking the bank on on a lot of different pest management strategies and instead just putting it all into prevention. Yeah, I recently had a white fly situation with a cotton tree that I had. It's still at its like juvenile stage with the with this cotton tree and I was thinking to get some ladybugs to eat them all <laughs> but then i was looking online and it was just so many ladybugs for the amount of white flies I <laughs> like i think there's six white flies but this box is, has two thousand ladybugs in it. <laughs> yeah that was my problem so yeah. i had to go to an insecticide to kill it because yeah that would have been a waste for me to get these ladybugs inside of a really small patio yeah and realistically, we definitely will recommend if somebody's experiencing kind of these smaller scale issues and they're not like commercially selling the product, if they want to look at things that may not necessarily be chemical, you can always look into just soapy water, baking soda and water, using things like for chewing pests. So for caterpillars and things like that, we'll, a lot of times we'll say, just go ahead and boil in a pot of water a bunch of uh a bunch of cayenne pepper in water. Yeah. And then you can go ahead and just let that cool down and then pour that in a bottle and spray that on your plants. Anytime these insects start eating it, they, it's, they taste the cayenne pepper. They do not like that. Yeah. There's tons of different things that we can do to treat individual plants. And I've even seen, <laughs> I've even seen people just take a single tree that was experiencing issues of six or seven feet tall, but they basically just covered it with like mosquito netting almost and then they basically just took that 2000 <laughs> 2000 ladybugs and they just opened that sucker up underneath that that netting and then just trapped everything inside of the tree and so in that instance you just have a, a tree absolutely covered in ladybugs wow. <laughs> so there's really no way that, that that those insects you know your insects of issue are not going to be eradicated <laughs> yeah that goes back to the whole like integrated pest management and the steps in that. And I do have a, if anyone who's listening right now, there is a episode I have specifically that talks about that. I remember one time I spoke to you, Jansen, about when I sprayed neem oil on my hibiscus and mm. I told you how it fried my hibiscus. Yeah. And, <laughs> and now I realize I've never thought about it before but you're telling me the best time to spray things like that, especially that's oil-based, just to spray it at night. And then I started mm -hmm. thinking about it and I was like, oh my God, Jansen is like smart. <laughs> because I, <laughs> I, I know I don't always come off that way. <laughs> no, I was just thinking like, why didn't I think about this? Because yeah. the stomatas close at night and it's a lot cooler in the night as well the heat and then the oil is is not creating this environment to fry my yeah. hibiscus <laughs> i would say any anyone that's cooked chicken or just to cook something in a skillet or something like that knows that all you got to do is just heat oil up and so in the daytime we'll have temperatures on leaves sometimes depending on how stressed they are get anywhere from 80 degrees to 90 degrees your air temperature is usually going to be, you always want your air temperature to be higher than your leaf temperature on your plants, just because that shows that your plant is actively letting heat off and like breathing for all intents and purposes. But yeah, if you wind up essentially just giving it a really hot day, a lot of bright light, that and you cover, like you said, you cover the stomates in this oil, it's going to try to breathe. It's going to wind up not being able to going to close those stomates your leaf is going to start heating up rapidly because it has gases and heat trapped inside of the plant that it's not able to let go of and then on top of all that now you have uh, essentially a bubble or a lens that you've coated your leaf in that is amplifying 
light penetration and basically heating up, increasing light damage. Yeah, it's a whole bad mess. And there's so yeah. many people that fry their plants <laughs> every day. Anytime you use something that has the word oil in it, it is so recommended to use that stuff at night. And even then, most pest damage is going to wind up occurring at night. A lot of these a lot of these pests don't want to be outside during the day when it's so hot. A lot of them will begin to come out and crawl around and do most of the damage at the nighttime or in the morning. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, <laughs> so I just, I didn't think about that till later. And it just, and I'm one of those, <laughs> I think it also comes from your like personality type because when I'm sick, I'm, I'm, I'm a pill popper. I'm popping all the pills <laughs> to get rid of this freaking virus out of my system. Yeah. That's the same way I treat my plants. So you're just like, I'm just going to unscrew the lid on this bottle and I'm yes. just going to pour the thing on. <laughs> Three spritzes becomes a drench. And yeah, no. All of my I, plant knowledge is out the window because I'm trying to solve this problem. It is hilarious the amount of people that you're just like, how long have you been growing things for? And then you just, you run into a problem and then all of a sudden they just panic and start throwing everything at it. <laughs> just stop it calm down you know this, exactly. this is not how we're gonna do this it's like a guy that's there's a fire somewhere and somebody's just freaking out just throwing anything they can find onto the fire to try to put it out and you're just like that's wood that's straw don't do that yeah so in a lot of these instances whenever you have like over application of things like insecticides or any sort of chemicals you're putting on your plant there's a toxicity there. There's an opportunity for you to be the one that hurts your plant. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you've just put your plant in an even worse situation because now it has less healthy tissue to be able to deal with this current onslaught that's receiving from pests. Yeah, it's, it's always, like I said, trying to find these alternatives that may be much more precise in how they're targeting us, but also that leave no residue or the, there's no dosing recommendations. The only dosing recommendations that we have when it comes to utilizing these things is essentially for certain levels of electricity, certain voltages that you want to target for either eradication or plant stimulation. Yeah. Wow. Thanks again for coming on the podcast and bringing this subject to me because sometimes I get so stuck on the, the scientific like plant side I don't really get into the whole integrated pest management side of it. I don't think about those things, but it's so important because pests are things that we're going to live with for the rest of our lives, regardless if yeah. they're direct or indirect. And I will say some of the greatest strides that we've made in securing our food chains and just increasing our productivity have been just mimicking nature. So being able to watch essentially a prey relationship and how things can survive and how things in nature are able to withstand stress. And we're just trying to apply those as much as we can to our food systems. So it's definitely going to be very interesting in the future to see where that takes us. Oh, yeah, definitely. And one thing that I want everyone to understand is that when it comes to like North America or the United States specifically, we have to keep up with food production. So these things are very essential to our everyday lives as farmers, scientists, and people in other fields in ag, because we have to keep up with <laughs> the population growth. Whereas Russia used to be before before this whole war, Russia used to be like, I think for the last five years, they were one of the, like the number one agricultural for import. And that is because they produce things by season. And so if carrots aren't in season in the fall, people knew to get something else for that season. But in America, we we want everything now. <laughs> We're not going to wait <laughs> the next season or else there's going to be an uproar and conspiracy theorists <laughs> and all kinds of things. Yeah. <laughs> Why we're not having carrots <laughs> in the fall. <laughs> yeah, we definitely, it's interesting looking at how the globalization of our food market allows us to have such serious attitudes towards yeah. food. You're just like, I want my baby carrots now. <laughs> it's, I don't care if 
it's you know the dead of winter <laughs> and yeah. no one near you is growing an apple i want an apple like <laughs> so yeah there, there's definitely a huge impact at that seat it's crazy seeing people's attitudes towards food and I know there's plenty of people that I've met from Eastern Europe that end up saying, what's your favorite fruit? And they'll just be like, I remember the first time I had a banana. I had it on Christmas. It was my birthday. <laughs> and like, it was the sweetest ever taste. And I'm sitting there just, man, like I remember I got my first banana at the grocery store. So it just like <laughs> handed it to me for free <laughs> kind of thing. And so, yeah, there's definitely a huge disconnect on kind of appreciation of different kinds of food and I will say quick plug here, but not the business in particular, but just that's why we have companies like the one that I work for, which I'm not going to go on naming, but the one that I work for, that our goal is to try to like increase food satisfaction and food quality, shelf life, something, I, I hate to say that we were getting a luxurious attitude before, but something that we do need to get out of the habit of is this whole attitude of just buying bags of lettuce at the grocery store that's been sitting in transit for two to three weeks, and then you get it back to your house only to open it, and then within three days it turns to mush. Yeah, like the, exactly. There's this weird thought that we have in our heads. It's, oh, it's normal for salads to just go bad in four days, when in reality – that's just a short arm, a huge disadvantage that comes from our kind of inefficient transportation system. With these companies right now, I really want to plug these guys that are really putting everything on the line money-wise to increase that quality of produce and quality of nutrition. A lot of these plants, as they breathe and die in transit, they're losing nutritional value. We, we really want to try to not necessarily globalize the food chain because, yeah, you are taking nutrition out of everything and putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by having a, a, a huge supply chain that relies on transporting cargo from Australia to India, from Mexico to New York. So yeah, do some stuff whenever you talk about seasonality and farming, like that's definitely something that's much more beneficial to obviously environmental policies and kinds of cost effects of these damaging effects of climate change, things like that. Like you said, we're going to have to continue to increase our crop control, our yields and everything with our, with our population. Like we, we definitely will continue to see an increase in, in need for food, but at the same time, it's really going to be these effects of climate change, yeah. the things like extreme natural disasters and increasing temperatures. We have farmers that may not be able to grow the things that they've been growing for the last 50 years. Exactly. Uh, just because of the yeah, challenges of the environment. And so it's not only the challenges of the environment, it also has to do a lot of the times with the increase in population and culture, because 10, 20 years ago, people weren't buying organic foods. So they would yeah. understand that, oh, this carrot looks a little ugly, but they got it from the farm. So, well, Back then, I think back then, people were looking at things and thinking of it to be aesthetically pleasing to them. So now where people are into organic foods, they understand that, oh, yeah, this orange looks a little ugly, <laughs> but they know that the fruit is still good. Whereas 10, 20 yeah. years ago, that wasn't acceptable to sell it in a grocery store at all. Yeah. You have whole companies that have formed around this idea of we have a really a really snooty attitude whenever it comes to dealing with produce that may be perfectly fine, completely edible, highly nutritious, but it's too big or it's too small or it's crooked. You have companies like what is it? Misfit Market and different kinds of essentially it's re it's a really cool process we went to this farm that grew nothing but pickles and they talked about i say pickles they grew nothing but pickling cucumbers but they showed us at one point like oh this is just this is our dumping crate we have it was almost it's one of those like portable dumpsters that you see people drop outside of apartment complexes when they're renovating oh, yeah. but this was filled with nothing but cucumbers <laughs> and most all of them like were fine they just looked a little bit weird a little bit bent. but the guy was saying like we cannot sell these and this is about 10 percent of what we grow and in a season and unfortunately 
nobody will buy these. Yeah. We can donate them to, to people, but nobody in the market will buy them. But now you have these companies like Misfit Market that whenever I – the concept of how much would you sell these for if someone did want to buy them? And they're like, either we have to throw them away, donate them, or give them to the hogs. So at this point, you give me any money, I'll sell these to you for, for 5% of what they're worth. Wow. And now you have a company that is highly lucrative and also able to maximize their profits by targeting products that are very high quality but low value because of their inability to fit in the supermarket lineup. Exactly. Yeah, so it's cool to see new companies come in and take on that challenge of reshaping our food waste and being able to really get people produce at a reasonable price and for reasonable costs. And at that point, yeah, you're paying less money for these misfit vegetables just because of the way they look. <laughs> and that's, I'm sure nobody really cares at the end of the day. Yeah, You're not trying to buy a $600 strawberry in Japan. You're trying to buy a <laughs> five cent bag of green beans. That's not an example, by the way. That's a thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It There's is a massive thing. For one strawberry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's you not you don't even break into melons if you talk about those prices, man. But yeah, no. And it, it, again, all that comes back to is just Japan is such – they're so dependent on whatever they can grow that it actually has become seen as like – something viable as a gift. I can't just come into an American classroom and then they, they have that like cliche of giving your teacher a red apple. Yeah. She's who the F cares. Like I get this many red apples every day. Now you have, you go in to meet your boss at this place in Tokyo and you give him like a peach that's worth 50 American dollars. And all of a sudden that's just, that is a completely acceptable token of gratitude and that person will be very happy. And all of that just comes from the fact that it's hard to grow these things in such small spaces and such small like land masses like Japan. And it, it innately increases the value of these things. Yeah. So yeah, it's crazy. That's it. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to ramble there. <laughs> that's, I, that's, this is all great information. It's truly really relative because people don't understand the science that goes behind producing food for them and how if you don't understand, it's very easy to listen to a conspiracy theorist or have news from people who don't have the background or the knowledge and or experience about any of this to give you factual information and the stress <laughs> and the struggles that we go through. <laughs> oh yeah. The amount of people that will just scream at me because I buy GMO corn. <laughs> and I'm, like, I'm sorry. Have you eaten cereal at all in the last like exactly. 30 years? <laughs> like, you know, yeah, it is what it is. And right now, heck we're going to, we're about to see the release of potentially the world's, first highly accepted GMO tomato variety that is going to be this really cool deep purple that actually has an immense amount of anthocyanins in them and Wait, antioxidant potential. You, is this a special? Are you giving me a are you giving me a little bone here? <laughs> yeah, this is just something. I'm, yeah, I guess so. You definitely have to be in the in a bunch of newsletters to hear about this stuff. But uh, that's something that's on the way right now is a new GMO tomato variety. I can't remember off the top of my head the name of it, but it is essentially, it almost looks black. It's so purple. Oh, and wow. the real target for this one was to increase this anthocyanin account, the so medicinal compounds and plants that produce purple, red, blue colors, and are often associated with anti-cancer properties. So that's, it's cool. Yeah, One day you're just amazing. like, okay, eat this GMO tomato. It'll help you not get cancer. And then exactly. there's people on the side that don't understand GMOs are like, wait, but I thought GMOs gave you cancer. So it'll be, it'll really be making some people's head spin then. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think I should definitely do an episode on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. But I am your host, Tafari Green, and this is The External. You can look us up on Instagram at the.external. And Jansen, do you want to reintroduce yourself again? Yeah, I'm Jansen Gedwood. Lucky enough to have somebody put a microphone in my face. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'd love Coming out here and sharing this stuff, like I said, just make sure that you support your local food producers 
whether that be a greenhouse or a farm or even just a giant plant factory somewhere that just happens to be closest to you. That's the way that the world needs to work now if we're really going to try to increase our quality of life and increase our lifespans. Yes, Thank you. Yes. Please support your local farmers. You'd get so much stuff for free from them than you would a grocery mm -hmm. store. We're oh, yeah. much more quality. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but thank you all for listening. And this is, again, The External.